Hi, I'm Big Ben with this week's episode of Equip Tips, and we have a special guest today you might recall from season one of Framed, Ryan Muirhead. Hello. Famed film photographer. Famed and poor. Famed and poor, like all of us, because yes. we are all struggling poor artists. Ryan's come out today to talk to us a little about film cameras. And a guy like me, it's grown up in the digital age and only played with my little 35 millimeter cameras back in the day. Let's talk a little bit about film and how to trash and transition into it. Let's say like I'm a digital photographer and I want to get into film, what would I need to do? And then let's talk a little bit about the differences. I guess we're gonna talk about the differences between film and digital a little bit. All right. And pretty much whatever you want to talk about. Okay. I am your Beckon student, and you can put on the white lab coat of love. I'm honored. I promise you I washed it last week. <laughs> Look at that. Just my size. Yeah, just about five. Double breasted? Five X's is too big. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about film, Ryan. Okay, so if you're used to shooting a digital SLR and you want to try some film, which a lot of people do, one of the funnest things to try is medium format film, just because right off the bat, it's so different than what you're used to shooting. Meaning we go from a small sensor, or if we're lucky, a full frame sensor, such as a 35 yep. millimeter, to now we are going to Even the smallest a big sensor. medium format cameras, like a six by 4.5 camera, um, the negative on this guy is at least like three times bigger than a full frame digital sensor. So that means three times more, more the information, right? Yep. So more I, detail. I can show you right here. Um, this right here or this, whichever is easier to see, that's the size of your negative. You're telling me the negative is that big. Yeah. And this is the smallest of medium format cameras. That can hold a lot of information. Yeah, it's a ton. Um, at a full resolution scan of this negative, um, you're looking at probably the equivalent of like, I mean, I don't know exactly, but probably like 60 megapixels, getting a couple of gig files if you were to do the full resolution scan of just what's on there. That's almost as big as I am, dude. That's a pretty <laughs> big resolution. Um, and you can get that resolution out of $50, $100 medium format film cameras. They obviously go up to more expensive and nicer ones, but um, right off the bat, you can be getting way more information than you're used to. So I can get a medium format camera without going and making making our spouses angry and you know going and buying that 20 grand big medium format camera. I don't have to go spend that to get into it. Absolutely. Um, there's options which, you know, give you beautiful images, but even like the Holga and Diana toy cameras that everybody plays with, even those are medium format negatives. Really? So even there wow. on a $20 camera, you can have a gigantic negative. Awesome. Now, a lot of us shoot digital and we use the LCD screen kind of as a crutch, you know. You can take a picture, whether you've locked in your exposure or not, we've done the appropriate meeting and we can look at it and make an adjustment. Obviously with a film camera, we don't have that luxury. So should I be afraid of stepping into film? I mean, I mean, I say like you're, I'm a digital photographer and I know the basics of ISO and aperture and, you know, and shutter speed and all that. And I can get a basically decent exposure. Should I be afraid to go into film? I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit reserved. I'm afraid I'm going to go through like 10 rolls of film and, you know, and they're all going to look horrible and, and I'm not going to dare put them on my fridge for my mom to look at. <laughs> I mean, what, what am I going to do here? You know, the scariest thing about that, not being able to see exactly what you've just taken, is also the biggest reward of shooting film. It's hard, but it makes you learn what you're doing. I mean, you have to, because there's no, there's nothing to see what you just did, except knowing what you just did in your head. All my cameras have built-in light meters that when knowing what you're doing, you can use, but when you're starting, this guy's your best friend, a handheld light meter. Um, Which this one is an incident or a reflective yeah, meter, this so we one, can do both. Yep, this one has incident and reflective uh, spot or just bold metering like this. And we were talking about these in a, in a previous episode where uh, Zuzanna Audette kind of told us about the different types of metering. And these are just awesome. I think, you know, if you don't have a film camera with a built-in reflective meteor, meter, meteor. A built-in meteor. A meteor like that. like that. We're probably gonna have to go with something such as an incident meter. Yeah, you absolutely would. Um, once you get shooting long enough and you've shot ISOs that you're familiar with, you kind of get to the point where you sort of know where you're at. But absolutely, you want to be using some sort of meter to tell you where you're at. Do you do you use these? Have you 
do you implement these in your workflow on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, I, I take my light meter to every single shoot. So you, I mean, and it makes you look cool. I mean, let's be <laughs> honest. I mean, you know, the power of the light meter compels you type of deal here. I mean, I just, you know, I could. And when you don't know what you're doing, it's a great pause. Hold on, let me, let me check the light. Mm. Hmm, oh. Interesting. Hmm, let's just adjust our aperture by a half a stop. No, and... I, I, even when I shoot digital, which isn't very often anymore, but I always carry this. To me, checking the LCD screen is just taking you out of the moment. The looking at it, and the thing I hate most about looking at it is the, what it does to the interaction. Because either you look at it and you're excited and you look surprised that you did something right, or you look at it and you totally screwed it up and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what do I look like where they look this disappointed looking at the picture? You want to keep that relationship yeah. with your sub, and that's kind of an off subject, but keeping that rapport with your subject is an important thing. And I know, at least when I was starting out, I was one of those guys, I would shoot a frame, look, yeah. I'd go through 20 seconds of awkward silence, the model's sitting there like, come on, Big Ben, what are you doing, man? I mean, let's get going. And you kind of get out of that workflow. And so I guess by not having that LCD screen, you can stay in the moment and keep that rapport with your subject yeah, and this, for that entire time. Yeah, and this time. serves the exact same purpose. You know, what are you checking your LCD screen for? You didn't blow your highlights. You didn't clip any of your shadows. And that's what this does, you know? You meter the darkest part of your scene. You meter the brightest part of your scene. Now you know the range of the scene. You set your exposure, then you start shooting. To me, that's a lot simpler even than checking a screen. Now, the other thing too that we all know is that we have a greater dynamic range in film, you know, than even though digital's come so far from the first, you know, two mega, you remember the megapixel wars yeah. of the early 2000s, you know, it sounds like a science fiction, the <laughs> megapixel wars. You know, we've come so far from there now to where, you know, even digital, we're up to, you know, like a 26 megapixel camera it still doesn't have the tones or the detail as film. We still don't have the, that wide gamut of stops between darks and lights, right? One of my, one of my favorite things about color negative film, um, with film there's three main types. There's a lot, obviously, but when you're considering what to choose, you're probably either looking at color negative, black and white negative, or color positive, called slide film. That covers most of the available films um, that aren't instant film or alternative processes. But um, what I love with color negative film, which um, is C41 processing, is that basically you cannot blow your highlights. And there's so many- So would this be a good safe film to start with? 400 speed color negative film is the go-to learning film. Either a Kodak Portra 400 or a Fuji 400H, those are like perfect intro films. Really? Yeah. Um, so that'd be good to start with, because that's always a concern. You know, even in digital photography with our limited dynamic range, you know, we, if we're a, even sometimes even a half a stop off, you know, we've lost those highlights in the hair. Yeah. Or we've got those muddy blacks. And even with our cool Lightroom and ticks and techniques and the, the, you know, the recovery slider, we still, once that information is gone, it's gone. Yeah. Um, and like I said, on color negative film, you cannot blow highlights, which is so cool for shooting like a wedding dress or an outdoor scene, you know, harshly lit, is that six stops overexposed from your key light, your highlights will not be gone. Um, film's in the exact opposite range of digital, where in digital, you'll retain more shadow detail than you will with film at the equivalent speeds. But, uh, it, seems like, it seems like in digital photography, we meter for the highlights. Yeah. Now I've heard in film, you meter for the shadows, is that? Yeah, obviously the more you learn and the more you learn to see light, you know what kind of shot you're going for and you meter appropriately. If you're just making the switch and you're shooting a color negative film, the absolute fail safe is meter for the shadows. Um, and what I mean by that is you meter for the darkest part of the scene. Um, just a real basic example, if you're shooting like a portrait, um, we have some pretty good reflective light and everything right here, but generally in so a portrait, we're going to take a portrait of me. Straight on a view, we've got a say like we've got an LED. We have a studio light above us. It's, right. it's on access with our camera. Say it's a beauty dish or a softbox. You know, I've got that nice shadow below my chin. Exactly. Almost, in straight on lighting. If, if I had a chin. Almost always. <laughs> in straight on lighting, what you'll almost always be metering for in metering for the shadows in a portrait is underneath the chin. Um, so I would just uh, pull up my... No, not at all. My, no. See, the thing is, you'd, I, I don't even have to get right... 
can I come to the other side of the desk? Is that going to work? Sure. Like, if I was metering you and I didn't want to get too invasive, I have my light meter and I'm just going to point it. You, you don't even have to get closer. All you have to do is meter at the same angle metering for your chin. And if you shoot at that exposure, you're not going to underexpose your image. Wow. So that's a really quick way. Especially with the color, with the color negative film because, you know, because we're not worried about the highlights so much, we are worried about the shadow and losing the details in the shadow. Yep, so that's exactly. why you're metering for so the shadow. So metering for the shadow, just wow, like that. Wow, that is awesome. I'm so excited. Having you talk about this makes me so excited about stepping into film photography. Uh, not only because it's going to make me a better photographer in the technical aspects of learning my exposure and doing it right the first time in camera, but that even with digital, as neat as it is and how far it's come, it still doesn't have the detail the tonal range or the dynamic range that what film or celluloid has. It still hasn't quite caught up to it. You know, maybe my favorite part about film is that once you're over the scariness of exposing it correctly, knowing what you're doing, when you get a good exposure and when you know what you're doing, film has a look. Like, you know, digital raw files, you know, you're just trying to capture a good one and then you make it look like you want what you want it to look like. Films are all different, that they have their look kind of built in. Sometimes you can see that as limiting, you know, like, well, this is what it's going to look like. But once you're choosing your films correctly, it's so liberating. If I spend more than two minutes on an image in Photoshop, then I'm, like, exhausted. Like, what am I doing? So that's the goal to me, is to get it where I scan it, I look at it, maybe I do a tiny levels adjustment, a few dots of healing brush. I don't want to touch it past that. So each type of film, despite, you know, its intended use, it has its own personality. Yeah, absolutely. You they know, all have their own look. And, like, the C41, and you can get into lomography and cross-processing yep. and some. And I do that in my digital darkroom, you know, using curves adjustment layers. Right. But how neat would it be for me to shoot C41, cross-process it, and have that right out of the camera with that expanded tonal range, with that extra information, as well as that natural grain or yeah. that comes with it. And that's, I mean, it's all, of course, personal preference. But to me, grain and noise is no comparison. A super grainy image feels romantic and like a memory and timeless. And a super noisy image feels like a bad recording from a VCR. Um, something I love about film is how easily accessible different aspect ratios are and different types of cameras are and how it makes you shoot differently. Now, aspect ratio, that, that's like a big word. Okay, what so is aspect, aspect ratio? Aspect ratio, you're shooting on a digital SLR. It's mimicking the size of a 35 millimeter negative, which is 24 by 36. Length, height, woo, length, width, height, you know what it is. It's this, it's too high to three wide. And most people, that's all they know. Two, two, two high, by three wide. And that's know? what, yeah, that's what modern DSLR shoot. What, right. Two by three, four by six, eight by 12. So in my yeah. 35 millimeter film camera, it's obviously the same because that's what they were copying for the 35 millimeter sensor size. But in cameras like this, this is my Roloflex. It's a six by six. It's a square negative. And in this one, which I do a lot of my work on, it's a contact 645, which refers to a 6 by 4.5 ratio, which is a little more square than how long the digital is. So in digital, you're this, and in the 645, you're looking more like this. And I like that for portraits so much more, because in the 2 by 3, you know, you do the headshot when you give them enough room, you're seeing to like this weird mid-chest level. And, and as you guys all know, quick tip, on equip tips, you never want to crop at a joint or yeah. a weird level. So I've noticed that when so I'm shooting, often, you're, you're fighting that a yeah. little bit, aren't you? But in 645 or in square, you can get these beautiful no crop kind of perspectives that I just love. Tell us a little bit about whatever you'd like to tell us, talk to us about a little bit. Okay, I want to address kind of how it makes you shoot differently. Um, on this camera, um, just like your 35 millimeter SLR, this is an SLR camera meaning it's going in, it's hitting a mirror, it's coming into a finder. So you're single seeing- Single lens reflex camera. Single lens camera. reflex. You're seeing exactly what you're gonna shoot. Um, so the image is right side up in that. Yes, it's okay. exactly like that. Um, on this camera, which is my Roloflex, it's a waist level finder, which as you might be able to figure out from the name, means you're usually shooting it like this. So right off the bat, it changes your approach. Because now you're... So you're not... You can't hold... There's no viewfinder no, no, on, the, on the back of it. There is. You can push this in and you can flip this up and you can look through it like this. But the most common way to shoot these is from down here. So... Let's face... Let's do that. Yeah. So let's, show, let's show our viewers kind of... So right off the bat, instead of 
looking, you're, you're automatically at a low perspective and it's square. Um, and this is called a twin lens reflex, which means you're looking through one lens and it's taking the picture through another one. So there's no mirror that flips up and lets exactly. it hit the film. You you literally have a framing yep. lens, and, and you actually right, have the normal exposing lens. They're right on lens. top of each other, so there's not much difference. You're pretty much seeing exactly what you're getting. But the advantages of that is most of the noise from a camera is the mirror flipping up and down. Also, a lot of the camera vibration, you know, what shutter speed you need to be mm -hmm. at, is due to the mirror, how much it moves. Without that, on this camera, you can easily handhold a sharp image at like an eighth of a second. And get tack sharpness out Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. And You're it's not, almost silent. We're not limited by that. We're below a 60th, 60th of a second. Let's click on our VR or IS and, you know, let's exactly. try to nail it. You can you could hold that an eighth of a second and obviously you got to hold it still, but I mean, you're not worried about, about getting that motion blur. And I don't know if this will pick up, but... Uh... That's the sound of the shutter. That's, so that sounded really with sexy. Any, I'll be honest any with you. ambient noise, it's almost silent, um, and that's a great appeal too for like documentary or street work or you know holding this at your waist, just kind of you know no creepy well, stuff. And, and like and like when I've worked on film sets, I mean as a still photographer, I mean yeah. we can't be we got to have a blimp around our camera, some type of enclosing device to to silence that mirror. And a lot of what you're hearing in a DSLR camera, that shutter click is not actually the shutter gears, you're actually exactly. hearing the mirror flip up. Exactly. And so this is, I mean, this obviously looks cool. I mean, this uh, almost could be a prop in something. I mean, this looks so amazing. Now I'm assuming, Ryan, they probably don't make this anymore. Um, Roloflex, they still do make um, new film cameras, but you're looking in the five, $6,000 range. Um, I got this Roloflex, which is an extremely historic brand. There's been some unbelievable images come out of these cameras. Um, Richard Avedon's early work was all shot on a Roloflex. I got this almost brand new in the box for $300 on the internet. So, so uh, speaking of the Roloflex or any of these that they, you know, they don't make anymore, you know, like the contacts, the contacts they don't guys make, are gone. The Leica's, they, Leica still makes film cameras. Where would a guy like me go to find a place like this? I mean, am I going to dig out on eBay? Am I going to, you know, where would I go to find something like this? Um, eBay has a lot of stuff. They certainly have the most options. You just want to be careful, you know, figure out what you're doing. There's a site called KEH.com. It's a used camera broker. KEH.com. They're fantastic because they have a guarantee on all their equipment. If something's not right or it's not what you expected, you can return it. So it's, it, you know, so it can be bend proof a little bit. I'm really yeah. hard on my equipment. I mean, I, I sit on stuff, I drop stuff, I, you know, I'm out in the Salt Lake shooting, you know, I'm in water, I'll, you know, I fall over sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, KEH, they also have a rating on all of their uh, equipment. So, you know, from like new to excellent to bargain so to you ugly. Can, so you can see what you're yeah. getting a little bit without actually holding it. Because I know that's always a fear that we do when we have online shopping opportunities and, you know, in any type of technolo technology driven uh, medium, such as photography, you know, we're kind of worried because we're not physically able to hold that and have that relationship with it. We're kind of worried about, you know, is are we going to, what are we going to get what we're seeing yeah and with the rating system obviously that makes it a lot easier another great thing about film cameras such as roloflex or leica um these are both like german made cameras they're basically built to last your lifetime um i've shot on a roloflex that was from world war ii um and i shot on it last year and it delivered beautiful images leicas are made i mean they're made to outlive you so it's not looking at you know, next year, what's the new camera I need? I was eyeing the M9. <laughs> I could shoot this. I, I shot an M9 recently, and it's beautiful and well made, but it just doesn't compare for me to how... I mean, you know, everything digital just has this expected life of three, four years, and you just have to plan on it being dead. Um, Shutter gears wear out, you know? Yeah. And obviously, they didn't have... You know, we use plastics now and polycarbonates and, you know, and alloys and stuff, and back then stuff was more metal you know that generation of stuff was great yeah i expect to be shooting this until i die and not it. next year either until i die old and let's just point this out i mean this thing looks really cool i mean you know i you know this thing could probably cook a pop tart if i put it in <laughs> here i mean this thing could slice dice cook and fry and i feel like uh you know, this could be like a food dehydrator or something where I could make me some like fruit roll-ups or beef jerky. Yeah, there's definitely that cool factor. You wear these and you just feel, you know, it's just how, how cool it makes you feel. <laughs> awesome.
Um, so I guess just kind of to wrap up, um, in photography, you know, it's all about expanding your vision. Whatever you're shooting, if you're shooting digital, you're shooting film, everybody wants that, something that makes them see outside of what they're already seeing, something that pushes them a little bit further. Um, and somehow, over the last few years, just from nobody growing up on it, film's been like the scary way, you know? And it's really not. Um, and I, I love how it makes you see differently, how you have to see your pictures in your head. You know, everyone wants to practice their pre-visualization. What, what am I gonna shoot? What's it gonna say? Um, with me, the best way to work on that is to force yourself to work on it, you know? I don't have the screen. I have to work on that every time I shoot. I love that about it. That's definitely, I think, would be a unique challenge for any photographer, whether you're the beginner learning exposure or you're the, you know, the seasoned professional that maybe has shot film for 30 years and, you know, due to obviously the digital workflow being a more lucrative thing for a business sense, maybe going back to that to reignite those creative juices inside of you. I yeah. mean, I think it's important for all of us, you know, regardless whether we are a beginning photographer, the hobbyist that does it for fun, or the person that's uh, feeding his family and paying his mortgage to uh, still take time to shoot for yourself yeah. and uh, you know, get out there and capture something from a different angle or for a different perspective. I think a lot of us, you know, we fall into monotony, you know, we fall into mediocrity. And I think in my journey as a photographer and I shoot full time, with me shooting full time and trying to, you know, feed my family off of it. You know, there's a lot of times where I don't feel creative and, you know, it's looking at the same photos over and over on the LCD screen, yeah. going through the same process in Lightroom and Photoshop. And I think film would be a great way to really, really shake up those creative juices inside of me, as well as some of you out there, to try to try something new and to do something that is fresh, unique, and diverse. Yeah, even, I mean, it can be a really small venture. I mean, you can go to a store and pick up a $5 point and shoot camera, get some Walmart film, you know, and just return it there. Just, it doesn't always have to be about creating, you know, the highest resolution or the most pristine image. Sometimes it's just saying, look, I have something that can capture an image and getting out there and shooting, you know, just to make yourself think differently. Well, Ryan, thank you for coming out today. I recall seeing you last season on Framed and being so inspired by your episode and how it kind of influenced me to maybe want to start getting into film and to have you come out today and talk about the technical aspects of it, of what it would take for us to start this has been absolutely astronomically uh, inspiring for me. Yeah, and I'm happy to be here. I'm glad that you guys are tuning in. Ryan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> I'm Big Ben with uh, Weekly Equip Tips. I would bid you good shooting.